Hello, everyone. Uh, thank you for joining uh, Blockchain UBC Speaker Series in February 2024. Today, we have uh, Brian Archer, um, and Brian is the head of uh, marketing and operations for Wolf. And prior to Wolf, Brian worked at NYDIG, one of the largest Bitcoin only companies in the world, focusing on all aspects of brand marketing, advertising, and product positioning. Brian has 15 years of experience working on marketing strategy, operations, and content creation at companies like Prudential Financial and many of the world's largest ad agencies and production companies. He's passionate about the iterative process of building products and startups that add value to people's lives. And today, uh, Brian is going to uh, talk about uh, some of the recent innovations on Bitcoin protocol. And uh, without further ado, uh, let's welcome Brian. Awesome. Well, thank you so much for uh, having me today. And, uh, you know, it's funny that when I wrote the bio for this, I wrote the 15 years of experience and I it sounded really old. It's funny how uh, quick life comes at you. Uh, but yeah, thank you so much for having me today. I, um, yeah, I work for an accelerator program. I will tell you guys a little bit about that and what we do specifically towards the end. But mostly I just want to share about the development uh, happening on top of Bitcoin, you know, Bitcoin being, uh, in my opinion, the like true decentralized blockchain. Uh, there's no marketing agency to really share about all the different things that are going on. And if you're not paying it close attention, there's a lot that like sneaks by you. And <clears throat> I don't know. I don't need to tell people that like technology, but technology moves fast. So sometimes it's hard to like keep up with everything going on. Um, uh, so yeah, so we can dive right in. Uh, this is meant to be collaborative too. If you have questions as we go throughout things, I'm happy to answer any questions. I am very close to this technology and following along with the updates, but I am uh, more the marketing biz dev kind of guy. So if I don't know your specific technical answer to some of the details for this, I can put you in touch with people that will too. That's a big thing I want to share is sharing some of those resources for people that either want to get involved at like a protocol level to start working on some open source projects for people that want to start like building on top of, you know, I meet people across the range that like some have entrepreneurial visions, some have just love the technology and want to dive into the technology. So any way that I can be a resource um, to anyone on the call, I'm more than happy to be. So without further ado, I'll uh, dive right in. And, you know, really, I just want to talk about like for many years, it became Bitcoin became pretty stodgy. It became like you couldn't do that much on top of Bitcoin. And uh, I think that has changed today. I will say I think there's still certain aspects of it that it's harder to build on Bitcoin. I think with a lot of other blockchains, there's just possibilities to spin things up quickly, you know, with some of the foundations that are tied to some other blockchains, you know, they have a lot of resources available to you that like makes building on top of them really awesome. Um, with that said, though, I think that, you know, the underlying security protocol of Bitcoin uh, isn't going anywhere. And I think that's kind of the value of building on Bitcoin. You know, I, uh, I you know, there's some people that have like their intense views of like, all paths lead back to Bitcoin. It will all be on Bitcoin someday. I don't know. I can't predict the future, but uh, I'm sure interested to see how things continue to develop. So uh, with that, a lot of different use cases, a lot of different technologies we can talk through. And like I said, if people want to hop in at certain points, uh, feel free. I also will, if anyone ha you know has questions afterwards, feel free to email me or Chang if you want to uh, you know relay some messages. I'm happy to answer anything I can. But uh, on top of Bitcoin, a lot of things that we're focused on, I'm going I'm to talk pretty in detail about the Lightning Network in a se second, but nowadays we're seeing a lot of possibilities in terms of remittances and micropayments. There's these new gaming use cases. I'll dive into Nostr a little bit. Nostr is not a, on top of Bitcoin, but it's kind of like a Bitcoin adjacent protocol that's really interesting. Um, and kind of dive into like DeFi on Bitcoin and what that means and what the possibilities that exist there now. Um, so yeah, let's let's just dive right into the Lightning Network. So I think the Lightning Network is uh, really the inspiration for where Wolf was even born from, but I'll I'll tell you about that later. Um, so the Lightning Network is a L, uh, layer two built on top of Bitcoin, uh, and it's really a micro payment network. Um, it's instant, it's cheap, and it's scalable. So the original use case here was to try and have these transactions happen on a layer of bit on top of Bitcoin. From a scalability like perspective, I think was a lot of the early use cases looking into it for privacy use cases too. It's pretty interesting how the Lightning Network has evolved over time though. 
I personally see the Lightning Network going towards a path where like businesses will be using the technology a lot, uh, particularly like as things continue to evolve, you know, the way it works is that at, there's these different uh, nodes on the network and they all have, uh, you know, a certain amount of liquidity and these transactions pass through through each routing node. As that continues to scale and like self custodial solutions, which I think most people like yearn to build, they want to make sure that uh, not your keys, not your coins, that you use these self custodial ones. The liquidity on the network continues to be an interesting uh, development and how to build that completely self custodial. Um, what we're seeing a lot of is people using the Lightning Network for remittances at the moment. Uh, moving money around the globe is expensive. Uh, it's pretty predatory in certain areas too. For example, like sending uh, a wire or some kind of money transfer from the US to Africa, certain countries you're getting hit with like 18% fees. And especially for people that live in areas that don't have a lot of money, 18% fees is just completely like devastating to them. So there's a lot of talk about using lightning rails to send money. And this is a, a very interesting use case because it's not necessarily just sending Bitcoin to someone and have people then, you know, you need to do something once you have the Bitcoin too. And we're kind of at like a little bit of a chicken of the egg problem in certain places that like, yeah, you can move Bitcoin to somewhere very fast, very cheap. But if they don't have anything to do with that Bitcoin, then, you, you know, what was the point of transferring it there? So what a lot of companies are doing at the moment is using the Lightning Network and, you know, they call it Lightning Rails and basically working with an exchange in, say, the U.S. and an exchange in Africa, buying Bitcoin, sending it via Lightning, which is incredibly cheap to do, and then uh, reselling that Bitcoin on the other side. So that way you can transfer money from, like, U.S. dollars to, uh, what you know, the, the African franc, I believe it's called. Like, there's different use cases like that. People are doing that all around the world, like... US dollars that automatically show up in someone's bank account as pesos within like minutes. So it's a very interesting use case there. And it, like it could be a serious challenger to ACH and Zelle and some of those other uh, technologies that banks are using. Um, I think the Lightning Network, just being able to move Bitcoin incredibly cheaply, just opens up a world of possibilities and also doesn't rely on, you know, those. Uh, you know, waiting every 10 minutes for the next block to confirm a transaction. You know, I think that the the Bitcoin, uh, you know, that makes a big impact that you can move things faster. Um, another development that comes on top of Lightning is Taproot Assets. So this is being developed by Lightning Labs, who were the first to uh, put out an implementation of the Lightning Network. Um, historically, like payment networks struggle with a bootstrapping problem. Like anytime a new asset is created, you kind of need like a, an entirely new payment network created uh, with specific assets like demand. Uh, so Taproot Assets enables a payment routing uh, paradigm, which uh, is able to handle channels for any asset across the Lightning nodes. So uh, for example, there's like these edge nodes that have the possibilities of converting to whatever asset minted on top of uh, on top of Bitcoin and you're able to send it throughout the Lightning Network. I may have done a tough job of uh, explaining that there, but essentially the idea here is Taproot Assets um, is launched on Mainnet now, and it will be implemented on top of Lightning pretty soon. And then we're going to see a lot more stable coins on top of Bitcoin. So for instance, like Tether over Lightning, uh, it, I think is coming and coming very soon. And that's an interesting use case because the Lightning Network you now like could use a stable coin that's on top of an incredibly fast and cheap network backed up by the security model of Bitcoin. So I think that's going to be incredibly interesting. Right now, I think Tether's biggest one is on top of Tron. I see a world where that moves to Lightning and is on top of Bitcoin pretty soon. I also think we'll see like a lot of competition coming out of that as well, like whether it's USDC or other stable coins starting to pop up. There's also like a ton of work uh, whether it be using taproot assets or not, but people trying to build uh, stable coins that are completely using Bitcoin, uh, using basically like longs and shorts to be able to stabilize in US dollar terms, the amount of Bitcoin you have. So I think, uh, you know, it's something I'm very uh, interested in too, because if you go into the process of trying to explain to someone why they should use be using Bitcoin, uh, for payments, volatility is something that always comes up. And it's I think it will always continue to come up until we get to a point where, you know, the Bitcoin price does not move. Um, I think that could be 
move drastically, I guess I should say. I think that's going to get better. I mean, if you look at the history of it, like over time, the volatility is going down. It doesn't always feel that way, um, but the volatility is going down over the years as more people are using the network. So uh, I think it's kind of this double-edged thing, right? Where, you know, you want people using Bitcoin for everything. If you think it's the hardest money in the world and it's the best money in the world, it's not backed by a government. Um, you want them to just be using Bitcoin, but I actually think stable coins on top of Bitcoin will uh, lead a lot of people to their first exploration into this technology. Um, cool. Um, the next one to talk about. Uh, so ordinals and inscriptions. So uh, interestingly enough, Wolf started uh, at the end of 2022. We were announced. We had our first color in 23. Ordinals and inscriptions did not exist at that time, uh, but it's been exploding and it has some really interesting use cases. And it's also, if you look at like the mining numbers, like the uh, ordinals are everywhere and powering a lot of the fees behind Bitcoin at the, mo at the moment. And that has interesting use cases because uh, fees for miners are part of what keeps uh, the network secure. So it, it's, it, it's pretty interesting to see this new use case for the mining fees and uh, how ordinals have expanded. But essentially, Ordinals are a numbering scheme for Satoshis that allow tracking and transferring of individual sats. Um, so for anyone not too familiar with Bitcoin, there are 100 million Satoshis in every single Bitcoin. And now with this new numbering scheme, you can track and transfer those individual sats and therefore you can inscribe information to those. So those individual Satoshis or sats as people call them can be inscribed with arbitrary content so it creates like Bitcoin native digital artifacts that uh, using a, you know specific Bitcoin wallets can be transferred using Bitcoin transactions. So uh, the first use case that people started running at was just minting tons of NFTs on it. Uh, it was very interesting. The, the interesting thing here is that compared to um, what a lot of other chains was were doing was that you basically, uh, you know, your NFT was just, yes, it would be on Ethereum, but it was really just pointing to a server. And that server is where your NFT would be held. Now all this data is being stored on chain. So in that case, it's more durable and immutable and secure. Uh, and it was happening on Bitcoin. I don't know if anyone's followed along, but inscriptions uh, started happening across all other chains pretty quickly once they saw the popularity of it and this idea of like storing NFTs or security tokens, or even in some cases, people using stable co or creating stable coins that were secured on chain. The use case there is interesting because it just becomes expensive. You know, ordinals created, uh, increased the price to like, you know, get into the next block drastically. Um, so it was, uh, it was for someone not paying attention to it, it was a very interesting time in Bitcoin. I would say it still is because, you know, there's many people that are like, this is not what Bitcoin is for. We're creating the world's like most secure, hardest money, the best money that's ever been created. And there's definitely people that are just like, think of this as like spamming the blockchain. Um, the interesting part about that is kind of like the free market decides. <laughs> people are going to pay for what they pay for to secure these things. It's been an ongoing conversation uh, at like the protocol level of like, could you get rid of them? And I think the consensus there, a lot smarter people than I uh, have dove into this, but the consensus there is that like, if you were to try and filter out arbitrary data like this, you're all you're really doing is hurting the network them itself. So I don't think ordinals and inscriptions are going anywhere anytime soon. And I definitely will be interested, like as the next uh, bull market is upon us, who knows, maybe we're, maybe we're pretty close to it right now. Um, will other NFT collections move there? Because like, there's just an incredible amount of money on Ethereum and Solana and all these other things will be able to secure things to Bitcoin, keep continue to grow. I have a feeling that uh, could be the case. Uh, I will be, say there, it was just a, was it Sotheby's just had like the auction, their first uh, ordinals auction. And the, the it was like, I, I forget what they're called, the quantum cats. Uh, I'm pretty sure it sold for like $125,000. So I, again, I'm not an NFT person and it always, all the, those numbers always blow my mind, but it's pretty uh, crazy to see like how, you know, this technology is almost a, only like a year old and it seems to be moving some serious NFT players and collectors over to Bitcoin. Um, so Nostra, I mentioned Nostra brief, briefly. So again, it was actually developed by a Bitcoin core uh, developer and it actually used some of the 
technology, I guess architecture would be the right word of the Lightning Network for how it would work. But NASTER stands for notes and other stuff transmitted by relays. So it's a it's actually a pretty simple protocol that's uh, <clears throat> based on flexible event objects uh, that are passed around as plain JSON, and then they use standard public key cryptography for keys and signing. Uh, it makes it really easy for people to run relays and build clients, and like ensures that the protocol can be like extended over time. Um, I just realized I didn't switch to the slide over here. Um, so the early use cases of Nostr that we saw first saw people doing is basically making Twitter clones. Um, if you're on iOS, Damus, D-A-M-U-S is one you could check out there. Um, Primal is a great uh, Twitter, Twitter client that you can use on the web. Uh, and then I think there's Amethyst uh, is a really popular one that's on Android. So the early uses cases were basically creating these these come like decentralized Twitter clones. I think we'll continue to see some really interesting developments here in terms of like digital identities. Um, people are finding different ways to think about this from like single sign-on perspective, like you know, completely decentralized, like single sign-ons and OAuth and different things like that, and like building these digital identities that like finding different ways to like validate them across different networks uh, above my head to dive into it too deeply there. But I do think it's just like a very inter interesting decentralized network. And I wouldn't be surprised too, if you see that other blockchains starting to use it in different ways as well. Um, I think it's just like, uh, I also just think like the, the way these relays work and that anyone can spin one up and people have the freedom to choose what relays they're using. It's just like a really interesting like storage model in my opinion too, to see, how people can kind of add value uh, that way instead of just everything living in some Amazon data center somewhere. Um, cool. Uh, next thing, uh, just a general overview of some interesting technology to explore. Um, so Fediment is one example. These are uh, federations um, that basically it's a, it's a modular open source protocol uh, to custody and transact Bitcoin in a community context. So basically uh, their early use cases of this is a company called Fetty that they're doing it like in Africa where you basically could have these communities where you create a fediment and it's basically a federation where all the Bitcoin goes there. You know, the Bitcoin is stored um, in a way that, you know, really protects the people's privacy. I have no idea where that can continue to go. I could see that that protocol eventually live, using to like they almost like little Bitcoin federations, Bitcoin banks, could companies start spin up their own federations? I think that like, I just cannot predict the future at all of how that, those will continue to be used. Um, something that's very recently, I think it was announced in December is BitVM. Uh, so BitVM uh, creates a novel design space for more expressive Bitcoin contracts uh, and off, off chain computation. So, BitVM was kind of developed in a way that would not impact or change the Bitcoin network. One of the things like at a protocol level is that making changes on Bitcoin is hard. You know, the 40 or so like core developers that, you know, work on Bitcoin core, you know, it takes a long time to make changes in Bitcoin. I, you know, in my exploration and talking to different universities, like I actually found out there's plenty of like L1s that were stood up by people that were originally core developers and then got frustrated with the process there. You know, if you want to get a big change implemented into Bitcoin, like I don't need to tell you guys, if you're doing big research projects, you basically tie like years of your work to this research. And then next thing you know, it's like, it's not getting implemented. You don't know if it ever will. Like you need to have like a couple different core developers uh, kind of become champions and like sell, like really take the time to like go through your proposals <laughs> and think about, how implementing your changes could impact the overall network. So that's where Bitcoin moves slow. I think it really moves slow by design. Uh, kind of back to that thing I talked about in the beginning where like Bitcoin kind of had like a stodgy kind of view for a little bit was that, you know, the changes took a lot of time or there weren't pushing these changes. I think BitVM kind of opens up a world where you can kind of create some really interesting technology without having to change anything at the protocol level uh, just literally last week, I think it is, uh, I, I'm pretty sure it's called Citrea, but basically they figured out a way to do the first uh, ZK rollups on Bitcoin 
which then opens up a whole world of like EVMs being able to work with Bitcoin too. So that'll be very interesting to see what comes from that. Um, Liquid Network is another Bitcoin layer too, um, enabling the issuance and security tokens and other digital assets. Uh, Rootstock is another smart contracts platform or protocol that builds smart contracts on Bitcoin. And same thing, pretty similarly with RGB. It's a client-side validated system uh, and smart contract operating system uh, on the layer two and layer and three, they say, of, of the, the Bitcoin ecosystem. And the last one I'll touch on is Cashew. So Cashew is a free and open source Tromanian eCash system built for Bitcoin. So that is an interesting use case where it offers near perfect privacy for users of custodial Bitcoin applications. So that's another use case where like, I don't really uh, align that exactly as uh, being like Bitcoin, but it is like a, for the privacy focused people, uh, I think Cashew opens up a world of possibilities there. So I know I just rambled for a bit. Uh, if there's anything in particular, anyone had a question for, I can answer those too. Uh, but if not, I can tell you a little bit more about Wolf and then answer any questions there. Cool. All right. So now I'll tell you uh, why uh, a little bit about Wolf. So <clears throat> we, uh, at the end of 2022, we announced Wolf. Wolf was like a first accelerator program dedicated to Bitcoin and Lightning. Uh, our parent company is Stone Ridge Holdings Group. So Stone Ridge started a little over 11 years ago uh, as an asset manager. They do alternatives. And over the years, they've become a bit of a startup studio in the sense that when we have areas of expertise, we go out and create new businesses uh, in those areas. So we operate one of the largest reinsurance businesses. We operate NIDIG. Uh, it is a financial services firm focused on Bitcoin. Uh, one of the largest custodians in the space that's Bitcoin only, and it's also become a large miner as well. They also have like a full derivatives desk. Uh, Proof is another business uh, started around the same time as Wolf. It's an MGA for specialized commercial insurance. And then we launched Wolf. You know, the idea here is that over the years, we would launch one or two businesses a year in areas of expertise. And then with so much happening on top of Bitcoin and Lightning, the idea was instead of launching one or two businesses, <clears throat> what if we took that kind of Y Combinator tech stars model uh, and helped launch dozens to hundreds of businesses? Because we just felt like that was at the time where Bitcoin needed people exploring all these different areas. So we offer a program that basically any team that gets into it gets guaranteed seed capital, which transportation and lodging from anywhere in the world. So <clears throat> in just about every cohort we've done, we've had people from multiple different countries, uh, you know, Bitcoin a lot of people think of it as freedom technology, and we care about uh, getting Bitcoin all over the world, specifically in areas with authoritarian government. So we kind of want to make sure that we attract the best and brightest from all over. And, the, you know, the main value of what we do is just like a full time in-house expertise. So we have uh, experts in Bitcoin and Lightning. I realize now I should have updated Taproot Assets is now what Tara used to be called. And basically what we do is we bring in eight to 12 teams per cohort. We do three cohorts per year. Um, and like I said, we have everyone, we pay for people to come from all over the world because it's exclusively non-remote. We really just believe in building together and bringing a bunch of different people interested in Bitcoin, interested in building companies together. It kind of creates an energy that really can't be recreated anywhere else. Um, so that's why we make sure that we can bring people together and have them stay in New York City. Uh, you know, we connect people across uh, the expertise that we have at all of our companies. So whether it's talking Bitcoin and wanting to do something in regarding cryptography or talk with someone in mining, whether you want to talk to someone uh, from the asset manager in terms of structuring and building new products. Um, and then we really dive into business development in terms of brand strategy, advertising, and like uh, building a business, you know, especially with people that are like technically savvy, sometimes the process of how you build a product, how you iterate on it, how you talk to customers isn't really like second nature. So that's something we really work on people for, with. Um, like I mentioned, we're the heart of New York City. So really like at the most, you know, really is the most inspirational place in the world to work. Uh, I feel very fortunate that I get to have that view every morning. Um, one thing I just want to tell everyone about, there's a hackathon that's actually happening right now. It's called Top Builder. If you search uh, Pleb Lab Top Builder, we uh, supported the team there. It's a Bitcoin hacker space in Austin that people are going through this program right now to just kind of build on Bitcoin 
really like the really great guys building a community where you can see what other people are building, get early testers, get early uh, feedback. So definitely recommend checking that out. <laughs> and then, as I mentioned, uh, some technical resources. So I mentioned Lightning Labs, you know, they released the first implementation of the Lightning Network. Uh, Lightning Dev Kit and Bitcoin Dev Kit are awesome. They're released by um, Spiral. Spiral is a non-revenue generating branch of uh, Block, which is Block is Cash App. That's Jack Dorsey's company. Really talented developers there building excellent resources and libraries for you to work off of. I mentioned Liquid earlier. That's built by Blockstream. Um, Chain Code Labs is definitely something I recommend for anyone interested in starting to get in development on Bitcoin or Lightning. Uh, they're an open source. Uh, they do like really incredible work around the world, but they run a program uh, teaching you the basics of building on Bitcoin and building on Lightning. And also Base58 is another great resource that uh, Lisa put together a program that really teaches people or teaches developers how to start building on Bitcoin and some of the fundamentals you need to get started. So there, like I mentioned, you know, it was hard to build on Bitcoin. I'm not saying it necessarily is that much easier now, but there's a lot of opportunities to get involved and get building. But yeah, that's uh, that's all I had today in terms of like presentation mode. Uh, as I mentioned, I'm happy to answer any questions, whether it's even directly related to Bitcoin or not. But if people are interested in any of the protocols I talked about, uh, if people are interested in like, you know, even if you're not, you know, you're building a business that doesn't have to touch Bitcoin, if you want some feedback on how you even get started, happy to answer that. Uh, and yeah, I'll leave it at that. Thank you very much, Brian. It's so exciting to hear all the innovations happening on the Bitcoin protocol. And so we, I see there is a question in the chat. Oh, well, now I stopped sharing the screen too. Um, quick question. For people building on Tabro, can you share more about the kinds of assets they're looking at? You mentioned stable coins, but how about physical? Yeah, absolutely. Um, yeah, there definitely is uh, interest in putting like real world assets on top of Bitcoin too. I think that'll be continue to be interesting to see how that develops. I think part of those kind of things, like there's almost like a regulatory and compliance layer that like, I think complicates some of the real world assets being built on that, but people definitely are exploring that. That is one of the early use cases. Like I think stable coins is almost like the step one. Um, but in terms of like minting and storing other assets, uh, that it definitely is in the pipeline and something that people do talk about. Taproot also like only went live, I want to say maybe six months ago too. So it's pretty early in terms of the development of that and uh, what people, you know, I'm, I'm interested to see what people will be doing next. It also started on just Bitcoin. Um, so as it gets implemented on the light, lightning, I think that's when we'll see uh, I don't know, an explosion of building on top of it too, because if you're doing it just on top of Bitcoin, you're still waiting to those blocks. You're still paying high fees. Uh, once things are on top of Lightning, you can move these things for like fractions of a penny. And I think that's when we'll really see what people are up to and what they're going to be launching. I will say too, like some of the other things too, is people were <clears throat> launching other coins too, like, uh, you know, like I don't, I'm sure you guys follow out like Solana, and you see all these different coins, and it's just like, uh, the, for lack of a better word, the the degenerates trading coins and speculating and doing all this crazy stuff. I personally uh, find that community incredibly entertaining to watch all the madness that happens in that world, uh, and there's some of that kind of happening on on top of Bitcoin too now. So uh, I definitely think once everything uh, is on Lightning, we're gonna see like. It, it'll be interesting. I'm sure a lot of Bitcoiners won't even like it that they're like, look at all this other stuff on top of Bitcoin. But uh, that's uh, that's uh, that's well, you yeah, know, how can you stop it? <laughs> yeah, so I see there's uh, Ibrahim raising a hand. Hello, Brian. Uh, thanks a lot for your presentation. Um, I have a, one comment followed by a question. So the use cases which you have provided mostly in your presentation, like digital identities or stable coins or NFTs, uh, I do believe that they already like existed in other layer one solutions such as Ethereum and solution. The fact is that they are now being uh, possible to run over Bitcoin by using the Lightning Network. Mm -hmm. So the, the the challenge which I see with uh, Bitcoin is its ability to update or or like um, 
modify mm-hmm. uh, and and especially with the case of uh, like uh, providing quantum safe uh, cryptography uh, i do believe that the other uh, uh, blockchains are more like capable of uh, adapting to safe uh, uh, cryptographic protocols so mm-hmm. i'm wondering like uh, what do you see like how bitcoin can adopt or in future five to seven years when there is some quantum computer and there is a real threat to like uh, the underlying architecture to the bitcoin so how mm-hmm. it will be able to adopt to that challenge yeah, I mean, I, I I think that you're it's a you have a very smart question. <laughs> um, I think the in terms of adoption, I think it really comes down to like philosophically, if people do ever feel that Bitcoin is just the only protocol, the only L one that's like truly decentralized. Um, I like I am not like someone that goes around preaching that like everything else isn't truly decentralized. Um. But, you know, I the the example I always use is that like the Ethereum uh, with like if Ethereum is like when they put out like a roadmap of exactly what the development will be over the next few years. Uh, I forget what, what was the terms that they used. They had all those like funny they, they they all rhymed about like the different layers of like when they moved to proof of stake and then like what would be happening right. next and splicing like. The fact that the Ethereum Foundation can even put out that information in terms of exactly like what development would happen to me just like removes some of the feeling that like the true decentralization exists. Um, Again, I'm not like I I don't get overly preachy with it, but I just think that like part of the reason it's hard to change Bitcoin is because of the, you know, it really moves slow a lot of times because there's no one that can make that that can force a change it like it takes a lot of time to get consensus in bitcoin and i think that just speaks to the way the decentralized nature of the core developers like i don't know it's like sometimes even watching like i i'll be honest like if i was technically gifted and wanted to work on a protocol level being a bitcoin core developer seems very very difficult and frankly like a nightmare sometimes you work really hard you build this thing you need to get other people to champion it you then have people that come out and say something against what you're building. And then you almost like something we see happens like on Twitter and things like that is that someone said, you know, someone puts out a suggestion for like why this is bad. Right. And then other people that aren't technically savvy, like gain that opinion. And they're like, don't change Bitcoin. Bitcoin's perfect. Like people that do not understand the technology in the slightest are now like screaming from the rafters that like, (laughs) you can't make this change. So I think that, like, yes, the idea of it's it's easier to build on these other ones. They already have it on these other platforms. Like, does that like, you know, th- it really comes down to like philosophically, will people just feel that Bitcoin is more decentralized than other everything else? I think there's probably an argument you can get into of like proof of work versus proof of stake and like some of the cap- uh, uh, complications that come along with that change, you know, like the a foundational part of Bitcoin is that it needs energy to do it. Like it's money backed by energy. Like is I, I feel safe saying it that like the, the switch to proof of stake, I think from like a marketing perspective and when people start getting into green energy and things like that, like it, it definitely is compelling, but I just think that's kind of what it comes down to is that like, as people continue to get, understand the protocols more, if someone trusts that Ethereum is safe and can't be tampered with, then yeah, they won't move over. Um, if people do get to a point that they like, <clears throat> you know, study Bitcoin and they're like, hey, this is truly decentralized and like there's a reason it moves slow and yada, 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 then I think that's how Bitcoin could win in the end. Um, I don't I don't guarantee that it's a definite win, but I do think that as people continue to like learn about some of it, that's how it would go. Um, but yeah, we'll see. I, uh, there, there's part of me too. That's like, you know, people talk about decentralization so much, like in my day-to-day life, there's a lot of centralized things that I work with and they go pretty smoothly and it's really, it makes the world function. So like there's, there's a, you know, I can make an argument on both sides too, where like having this technology where maybe like changes that have to be made can be made is important. Um, so we'll see. Thank you so much for your answer. Javiki. 
Hi, Brian. <laughs> Hi. Thanks very much for your presentation and for being here today. Awesome. Um, I, I just wanted to to drill down a little bit more into this question of uh, environmental energy sustainability. It's a big uh, a big issue for a lot of people, uh, especially those at the University of British Columbia. Mm -hmm. BC in general, we um, you know really have tended to to um, to really want to support uh, you know low energy and in mm -hmm. Canada in general. Um, are concerned about carbon emissions and so on. So I know you you talked about it a little bit, and you know, as a choice between, um, you know, a highly uh, how much energy proof of work takes versus some of the other protocols, and a choice between you know having the security that comes from that mm -hmm. um, versus you know the uh, lower level of security that you might have from some of these other consensus mechanisms. But I'm wondering if you have any insights on um, applications of Bitcoin that are that are developing that are actually promoting environmental sustainability and you know where Bitcoin is actually being used in in some um, sustainability type projects. Yeah, absolutely. I think. Um... I think the, 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 I can tell you my own personal philosophy too. It's like, I was a biology major in college and I care a lot about green energy and environmentalism. I, I'm a huge component of composting and like the changes it will make on people's world if they stop throwing away so much food and composting it and using it. And I don't even put my leaves out anymore because like I let my leaves uh, compost in my backyard. You know, I think that when it comes to like proof of work and the energy usage, um, there are, I'm pretty sure 50% of miners at this point are using green energy at times. And I think in general, the energy, uh, usage of the world is sometimes misunderstood in different ways. You know, something I've seen like in green energy too, is that there's a lot of waste that happens in terms of like the sustainability of the grid and the structural, like, is that like, you know, when wind stops, when the sun stops, it's like, can some of these green energy transitions actually power the amount of energy we use? And also tied to that, if you had to tell the general population, like, hey, you need to use less energy because it's green energy now, is anyone turning off their TV or not charging their things and different things like that? So I think that when I think of it from that perspective, um, a lot I see a lot of the green energy opportunities as like, still needing some of the energy infrastructure of natural gas and all the other things that come along with it. Um, there are a ton of green energy use cases that are kind of tied to Bitcoin mining too. So a great example of that is happening in Africa um, with Gridless. Um, I'm, I can I can pull up the, uh, the website there. Uh, the Human Rights Foundation is pretty closely tied to this. When you need energy for small villages or for towns, and the people can't pay high premiums for that energy, they basically just go without energy. So in Africa, you can have some towns that have energy, for, they, they might have electricity for four or five hours a day, and then it just shuts off because the grid, it doesn't make sense to keep pumping the energy there. So what some companies are doing is creating basically like um, shipping containers that are full with Bitcoin miners. And by leveraging the energy for Bitcoin mining, they're st stabilizing the grid in those communities so that people have access to electricity 24 hours a day. And if there's ever use cases when they can shut it off, they'll shut off the miners for when demands are going to households and things like that. Especially in areas with like Africa or things like that, where there's rivers and there's, you know, large areas to set up um, solar panels and things like that. There's a lot of use cases where we can actually help people and make it financially sustainable using like Bitcoin mining. So I think that's a really interesting one. Alex Glantzseed from the Human Rights Foundation just put out an article about Gridless. Um, I'll, I'll share it in the chat and or you guys can share it around. It's really fascinating to see the use cases there. I've also seen some other things too where, you know, let's say... Um, you know, someone is trying to use more green energy and they're using solar panels, right? If they don't have a use case to use that energy right away, let's say like a big airport or something like that, if they don't have a use case for all that energy right away um, and the energy company doesn't want to buy that ele extra electricity back from them, it basically just goes wasted. 
So there's situations like that where people are finding out that like some of these green energy setups, it's like, hey, you're actually now have a use case where extra energy can be converted to Bitcoin and therefore become like a sustainable business by setting up more green energy things. So there's a lot of different use cases like that. You know, I, 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 uh, the, the other one I'll share too is that like in Texas is a popular one with Bitcoin mining is that, I don't know if you've ever seen like the flaring of natural gas is basically if they have the extra natural gas, they don't do it. They're using these flaring. And now we're talking about like, you're literally just burning natural resources because you can't convert it to energy right now because there's no one use cases. So that's another thing where like, if there was a mining facility set up there, you now are again, stabilizing the grid, not wasting things and converting it to like the money. You know, there's a larger philosophical debate that people can make in terms of money is the source of all war and the fun resources of the source of all war. And if governments didn't control the money, would you uh, have some of the fighting that happens? Like, I don't, I don't personally dive too deep into some of that. Like I can under, I completely understand the arguments there, but I think for the most part, there's more good than harm. And we'll continue to see how that evolves. You know, I think that interesting use cases, it's like something I think about a lot is Tesla, right? Like you buy a Tesla and you're charging your car and that's great. You're, remo you're reducing emissions in different ways. But the power plants that are still charging those cars are still burning natural gas and different things too. So it's almost like that energy still comes from some of the natural resources that we're trying not to d dilute too. At the same time, the counter argument to that is like, hey, you got to start somewhere. Like you need to figure out like, all right, we're switching all the cars to this. We'll figure out different ways to get clean energy to power those cars. You know, I, I think sometimes I see people that go so far to the extremes. It's like politics, right? It's like, you don't have to pick one side of this debate. You know, there's a, you know, not everything in the world is a black and white issue. Usually the truth exists somewhere in a shade of gray. So I think it'll be an interesting conversation. I do think that for a long time, the media looked at crypto as a way to like blame it the same way they looked at like uh, these data centers. I think AI is going to be the next one that comes under the scrutiny of like, look at all this wasted energy that all these, uh, you know, all the, you know, training AI bots or like how much energy is going to that. So uh, there's no perfect answer. I think there's really interesting use cases of how people are doing this. I do think stabilizing the grid, especially in areas um, that don't have it is a really awesome use case. And uh, yeah. Thanks so much. That that was a really um, interesting and 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 full answer, and hopefully gives you know people who in this part of the world in particular, you know, not that it's it only in this part of the world, but we in particular are very focused on those issues. Yeah, yeah, it's interesting. You know, I like I care deeply about it. I I, I there's so much stuff that like you know some of these initiatives. I, I talk to a lot of people with some of these like green energy initiatives and like. A lot of it sounds really great and I want to push forward and like, you know, there's going to be mistakes me going through it. I actually see like this, uh, this use case is very interesting to see, like, let's not waste energy and let's, you know, create opportunities to use more green energy. So we'll see. I, uh, I can't predict the future, but we'll see. <laughs> yeah. 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 That's great. I'll turn it over to others who have questions. I've, I've lots of questions if, if nobody else has questions, so you can come back to me, Chang. <laughs> <laughs> Sure. Um, uh, any questions uh, from the audience? Uh, yeah. Uh, looks like no. Then yeah, Vicky, please go on. <laughs> <laughs> okay, I'm gonna be the, the question asker. Well, so so you know, a lot of a lot of our students who are uh, studying blockchain technology here at UBC would um they they might be new to to bitcoin um and so i guess you know maybe a good thing to ask would be like you know how how is you reference the core developers mm -hmm. and um how is bitcoin governed how do things happen in the bitcoin ecosystem and who are the big players if we if we want, if they, you know, if the students want to follow and find out who's putting forward ideas and really get, you know, into things, um, they need to know, you know, how, how are things done and who's doing it? <laughs> yeah, for sure. So um, the best use case, and I'll share this over with you. And of course, uh, they use the Linux foundation for it. 
Um, this is the Bitcoin protocol mailing list. So that mailing list is free for anyone to sign up for. And basically any of the main discussions that they're talking about in terms of development can be found there. Um, there are also some really amazing people in the Bitcoin space. Um, I can share some of uh, their Twitter handles and things like that. They're basically, I actually don't know the hard number. I, you know, I've always heard it as like 40, uh, somewhere around there. But, but there are basically like 40 developers that have, uh, you know, different levels of power in terms of, uh, you know, it, power is not even the right word. Uh, maybe influence is more of the right word. Um, and they come together and review all the different BIPs. So BIPs are basically uh, proposals that are put out there uh, for different developments. Um, for core developers, they can go through different ones. You know, there's the controversial ones. BIP 300 is like the drive chains and creating all these different side chains and drive chains on Bitcoin. Um, and basically put up, people put out BIPs and then people review them. So in terms of like pushing things forward, um, you basically need to almost become like a PR and spokesperson for your proposals that you put out there. So you put out that proposal, you share it around, you share it with the mailing list. Um, people do Twitter spaces, people go into different like comment things and talk about them there. Like I mentioned, you kind of need to have like a few people like champion the idea behind it. And I think that really comes by like just sharing with a lot of people. Um, I will say like, even from watching it, like, they are incredibly interactive. They will, like a lot of the core developers will talk with people. There's a lot of conversations that happen on, uh, what is it called? The Bitcoin, I forget what it was. There's a forum. They don't use Bitcoin talk as much anymore, but there's a different forum, Bitcoin stack. It's not their stack exchange. I'll, I'll, I'll make sure to link it to everyone. But like, if you really wanted to talk to people at the protocol level, they do like an incredibly uh, great job. There's also like a monthly, um, Twitter space that's hosted by a few of the different core uh, developers where they talk about the different proposals. And, you know, I will say a lot of them do like an amazing job, like trying to stay completely neutral and share the way people propose it. Even if some of the people are opposed to it, they still try and come at it from a very level headed perspective. And then of course, on both sides, you have some very strong willed person that screamed from the rafters about what they're doing and what they think should be happening. Um, like I said, I think if you want to get involved at the protocol level, my my advice is like, understand what you're getting into. Uh, there's plenty of different ways to get review and do some PRs and things like that. Um, but I do think that like, you really need to believe that Bitcoin is pretty much the only protocol that matters and that that's what you want to like dedicate your life to if you want to get involved with it. Because it really is like, you know, you can come up with a proposal that doesn't get through for 10 years like that. That's a serious commitment. You're like leaving things to other people's hands to like go through it. So I will say that I, I think if you want to get involved at Bitcoin protocol level, you got to really, really believe in Bitcoin and the path forward. I think that the interesting thing to get involved with too is Lightning. I think Lightning's, uh, you know, some of the people that work on the protocol level of Lightning um, are, you know, Lightning moves a little bit faster. Uh, there's more stuff to do. There's also different implementations of Lightning. So LND is the one from Lightning Labs. I think that makes up about like 75 or 80% of the network. But I mentioned that Lightning Dev Kit, you know, that's the spiral. Their implementation is very popular as well. There's Core Lightning that's out there. That's another implementation of the Lightning Network. And they all communicate in similar ways. There's certain things that may be implemented on one that aren't in the other. For example, splicing, I think now exists on Core Lightning and it eventually will make its way to some of the other implementations. So I will say that I think that if you're <clears throat> really looking to get your hands dirty, uh, Lightning might be a really interesting way to look at that protocol and how that's developing. Um, but yeah, I don't know why my Twitter search is uh, performing terribly at the moment that it's not pulling up the people I'm trying to share. But uh, um, let's see, I, I'll share some of those different people to follow and uh, the resources they put out there. I will say if you want to, if you want to follow along, it's actually not too difficult. They do a really good job and. Again, some of these people just do it for like grant, you know, a lot of the core developers are based on different grants that they get from different uh, foundations or things. I mentioned Chain Code Lab, they sponsor a few core developers. NIDIG actually sponsors a few core developers as well. Um, Bitcoin Brink uh, is a foundation that some of the ETFs, which I'm really happy that they're doing that, like several ETFs are now donating like 5% of their profits to some of these 
uh, foundation. So it might become easier for people to get grants to work on Bitcoin or do different research on Bitcoin. So that's exciting. Uh, and yeah, I'm kind of rambling at this point, but I, I'll make sure to share some of those uh, uh, places that you can follow along. That's really great. And we can, uh, for those on the call, we can send out those resources with a link to the recording as well. Um, so I, I think we're, we're getting close to the to the time. A um, couple other questions. So uh, recently we had the SEC approve the Bitcoin ETF and, you know, there's still a lot of conversation about regulating cryptocurrency mm -hmm. and, um, you know, of course, consumer protection with the, everything that happened last year um, and, you know, protecting people from criminal activity. Um, which, of course, there's been an association of Bitcoin and all the crypto, uh, but mm. Bitcoin in particular with ransomware attacks. So can you can you tell us a little bit about the conversation that's been going on within the Bitcoin community around uh, regulation and, um, you know, those are the kinds of issues that uh, regulators are looking at? Yeah, I think it, it you know not an expert on this stuff, but I do work with some experts on this area. I think it's going to be interesting to see how it continues to evolve. You know, I think over the next two years too, we'll see what happens with um, Ethereum and Rithbull in terms of like the whole commodity versus security debate, you know, that that'll make its way to the Supreme Court and it'll be interesting to see what develops there. You know, I, I do think it's another one of those things where, um, the media and things run with narratives in terms of like, this is how much money was transferred to people there. And then like the research comes out and like, if you look into it, it's actually like a really smaller portion of that. And like, it could have been cash or something like that. Um, so again, I, some of it sometimes feels like just narratives that exist out there. Um, I do think that like, you know, privacy was definitely one of the early things that Bitcoin was focused on, but like, as it's developed, it, it's a public ledger. So there's almost like a part of me with some of this stuff that like it's actually more transparent than anything that does exist out there. You know, protecting that privacy is important, but we'll I think we'll continue to see how it gets regulated in that way. You know, lightning at the moment, like the senders are pretty private, but like the receivers are aren't. So like there are these use cases too where like a regulated entity that, you know, there's tools now where it's almost like into it for Bitcoin, where you actually can show and when things were converted and received, like I, I think a world uh, can exist where things are regulated, but still completely like fine and using the money. You know, I talk to people about it a lot, you know, like, you know, privacy, speed, uh, the fact that, the you know, there no one can print more Bitcoin. Like if we lose the privacy battle in the long run, but there's no one that can print more fiat money. And now we have like the first stable asset and inflation, you know, the entire conversation around inflation changes if hyper Bitcoinization ever happens. Like there's a lot of good that still comes if we stop, you know, central banks from controlling how much currency is printed. Um, so I, I think we'll see. I, I, I don't, you know, I don't have strong feelings. You know, there's people out there that have their different feelings about governments and why they print more money and things like that, you know, I often think a lot of that comes down to like uh, people with good intentions, but bad execution. Like it's not like some someone's, you know, people aren't evil. They're just trying their best and they're operating within the frameworks of what they can operate in. So, you know, I don't, I don't think there's ever going to be a world where like Bitcoin can be like regulated away. Is there a world where maybe like the privacy that people want isn't exactly what we end up getting? I think that's very possible. Um, did the mission of Bitcoin still succeed if that's the case? I probably think so. I, I feel that way. I mean, like at the end of the day, I want my dollar to still be a dollar at the end of the day. And if people can print two of them and now my dollar's worth 50 cents, I prefer a world where my Bitcoin is still one Bitcoin. So we'll see. I uh, I, I can't predict the future, but I, I do think it'll be interesting. And I think we have uh, some pretty, I would say, undeniable and uh, powerful technology. Yeah, yeah, it, it certainly, um, it, it's certainly going to be an interesting world, um, you know, as we're entering into some, some pretty significant uh, political and geopolitical changes mm -hmm. uh, ahead. <laughs> um, of course, no conversation of Bitcoin about Bitcoin would ever be complete without 
who is the latest Satoshi Nakamoto? <laughs> so, uh, yeah. What do you think about the latest theory that it's a Dutch cryptographer or uh, uh, I'm not sure if he's Dutch, but, you know, <laughs> he's basically I, uh, Cuban, I think, or something. <laughs> I am. I do have my thought about who it could potentially be. Yeah, there's like two or three that I think it pretty clearly could be. Um <laughs> I think the protocol has evolved over, you know, some people don't like this theory, but I, uh, Jameson Lopp, I think is the first person I saw say this. Um, the protocol, you know, a lot of people think like Bitcoin was built and it hasn't been touched, but like, I think like 90% of some of the original work that was put in it has now been developed by the core developers over the last, whatever it is, 11 years, 12 years. Uh, I believe in the philosophy that like we, like we all are Satoshi now, you know, it's like it was <laughs> the great. protocol has developed from consensus. It's continued to develop from consensus and the people have spoken. So I, I believe in that philosophy. I like that one. That's very uh, Bitcoin-esque, I would say. <laughs> yeah, it's not possible without a lot of really smart people working really hard, focused on a mission and, uh, you know, definitely thankful it was ever created in the first place. But it took a lot of work to get here. And there's a lot of people that uh, uh I think the world will thank someday. Yeah, well, I really hope by having you here today, we can encourage our community here to get engaged in helping and in, in advancing and, and also becoming uh, Satoshi. <laughs> um, <laughs> and and so I guess, um, you know, you've, you presented a lot of new developments, interesting new developments. And, and to end on a, a more uh, serious and perhaps practical note, then, you know, um, if, if you could pick, say, to the the top three uh, challenges for the Bitcoin protocol. Um, they can be technical, they can be non-technical, um, you know, to help the researchers here at UBC to direct their attention to solving, because that's what we like to do. We like to solve wicked tough problems with our mm -hmm. research. Where would you direct these young researchers to point their attention? I... I think scalability will continue to be like one of the most interesting things. You know, there's a ton of different proposals out there. I shared some of them today and like lightning, you know, I kind of mentioned that like custodial lightning works incredibly well, but self-custodial lightning uh, has its challenges with liquidity. Um, I, I kind of see a world where like, that's not that big of a problem. Like if I have my own, you know, I have my own signing device at home where I hold my Bitcoin and it's not your keys, not your coins. And I use a custodial wallet just for whatever in dollar terms, I keep $200 on my custodial wallet. Like I'm not really at a giant risk there, but I do think self-custodial everything would be interesting. So I think that's very uh, powerful thing to think about. Um, scaling in terms of these like ZK rollups, especially if you've studied any of that stuff for other blockchains, I think that is something that will be coming to Bitcoin and is like a major scaling. And I think for people, Again, like, you know, sometimes talk to me, people th talk to me about DeFi things and I have no idea what they're talking about. Like, <laughs> like it can mean a lot of different things and like, it'll be interesting to see how that scales, but it's like, that's going to open up a whole new world of like doing stuff on Bitcoin. So I think that, you know, having more stuff to do on Bitcoin brings more brilliant minds to Bitcoin and that will continue to develop. So I think studying, uh, you know, side chains, drive chains and stuff related to rollups, uh, is some of the most interesting work. And I, uh, I'm happy to share some people that are diving into that too. Of when you send this around, I can uh, share some people, yeah, you know, some thought provokers. That's great. We would love that. So, uh, I think I'll turn it back over to Chang now. <laughs> yeah. uh, uh, thank you very much, Brian, for the wonderful presentation. Uh, so, uh, uh, just uh, make a final note here. Uh, we have recorded a session, and we will re uh, upload the session a recording to our uh, YouTube channel. So uh, if you want to listen to the presentation again, please do follow up our, our YouTube channel and uh, you can see the presentation. Yeah. On that note, uh, thank you again, Brian. And uh, I wish you a wonderful week. Yeah, thank you so much. Thank you so much for having me. Uh, and yeah, like I said, you guys have my email and stuff. So if you ever want to reach out, feel free to reach out. I'm happy to help if I can. Thank you. All right, have a good one, everyone. Bye-bye.